Ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students, a very good evening to all of you. Today we have gathered here for the 12th edition of Beyond Square Feet, the triannual lecture series organized by Asset Homes in connection with World Habitat Day. I welcome you all to a wonderful evening of discussion and deliberation on sustainable development, which is the need of the day. കേരളത്തിലെ വിവിധ ജില്ലകളിലായി ബിയോൺ സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റ് എന്ന പേരിൽ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് നടത്തി വരുന്ന പ്രഭാഷണ പരമ്പരയിലെ പന്ത്രണ്ടാമത്തെ എഡിഷന് ഇന്നിവിടെ തുടക്കമാവുകയാണ് നമ്മുടെ ആവാസ വ്യവസ്ഥകളെക്കുറിച്ചും അതിൽ വന്നുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന മാറ്റങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ചുമൊക്കെ വളരെ അർത്ഥവത്തായ പ്രഭാഷണങ്ങൾ സംവാദങ്ങൾ ചർച്ചകൾ എല്ലാം ബിയോൺ സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റിൻ്റെ ഭാഗമായി സംഘടിപ്പിക്കപ്പെട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് പതിനൊന്നാമത്തെ എഡിഷന് ശേഷം പന്ത്രണ്ടാമത്തെ എഡിഷൻ ആകുമ്പോൾ നമ്മുടെ സംസ്ഥാനം ഒരു നൂറ്റാണ്ട് കണ്ട ഏറ്റവും വലിയ പ്രകൃതി ദുരന്തങ്ങളിലൊന്ന് നേരിട്ട് കഴിഞ്ഞിരിക്കുന്നു ഇതിൻ്റെ പ്രത്യാഘാതങ്ങളെ ദുരന്തത്തെ നേരിട്ട അതേ ചങ്കുറപ്പോടെ നമ്മൾ നേരിടുമെന്നും അതിൽ നിന്നും പൂർണ്ണമായും പുറത്തു വന്ന് ഒരു നവകേരളം സൃഷ്ടിക്കുക തന്നെ ചെയ്യും എന്ന ശുഭാപ്തി വിശ്വാസത്തിനൊപ്പം ഇതിൽ നിന്നും പാഠങ്ങൾ ഉൾക്കൊള്ളുന്നതും തെറ്റുകൾ ആവർത്തിക്കാതിരിക്കുന്നതും ഏറ്റവും പ്രാധാന്യം അർഹിക്കുന്നു ഈ ഒരു പശ്ചാത്തലത്തിൽ ലോക പാർപ്പിട ദിനമായി ഇന്ന് ഇവിടെ സംഘടിപ്പിക്കപ്പെടുന്ന ഈ പ്രഭാഷണത്തിന് പ്രസക്തി വളരെയധികമാണ് നിങ്ങൾ ഏവരെയും ഇതിലേക്ക് ഏറ്റവും സന്തോഷത്തോടെ സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുകയാണ് We will begin the program with an invocation for the blessings of the Almighty. I request the audience to kindly remain seated while we watch the prayer video. Sarvacharajarangalum ee bhoomi yude avakashikalana enna bodham ulli langeri kiriyan. Jadhi madha varga chindakal kadidamai maanavarashi onna anana tiricharivanu la vivegam nambil undaguan uru prarthana daivai idinna shravichalam. feed lecture series are organized by asset homes to bring together leaders and innovators of the real estate and related industries to explore solutions that address the challenges to the sustainability of the community before we start the main program of the evening allow us to inform you a little about the company asset homes through an audio visual presentation 
കേരളത്തിൽ ഇന്ന് ഏറ്റവും ജനവിശ്വാസമാർജിച്ച ഹോം ഗ്രോൺ ബ്രാൻഡുകളിൽ ഒന്നാണ് അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് അത് തന്നെയാണ് അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിന്റെ വിജയവും കരുത്തും അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിനെ കുറിച്ച് ചെറിയൊരു ഓഡിയോ വിഷുവൽ നമുക്കിനി കാണാം Over the years with projects across all major cities in Kerala Asset Homes has made it so Along with hundreds of Keralites from across the world I too am a proud owner of an asset When it comes to owning a home today Asset Homes is Kerala's first choice A seed was sown in 2007 it grew nurturing relationships to spread its trade of responsibility known as nanmamaram the asset value tree is rooted in four unfailing values prompt delivery total quality customer centricity and societal responsibility i believe like justice a home delayed is a home denied I received my asset on time and so did all others. Asset Homes is the first and youngest builder in Kerala to complete 50 projects in 10 years since inception spanning from Tiruvananthapuram to Kannur they stand as testimonies to Asset Homes promise of prompt delivery. home decor are a stickler for quality because whatever is of high quality lasts like my asset home compromising commitment to quality made asset homes the youngest builder in india to receive krizil da2 rating in just 8 years asset homes is also the first and only builder in india to receive krizil 7 star rating for three residential projects i maintain my work life balance The Asset Delight team keeps me absolutely tension free. They help me fetch my grocery, pay my bills, you name it. <laughs> Asset Homes and the customers, no? Asset Homes and the Delight service. <laughs> mm. Asset Delight is a bouquet of 17 unique services to the customer including 25 years free insurance coverage for the apartments and villas free transit home facility and many more to ensure that the residents have a comfortable and convenient lifestyle founded by a technocrat v sunil kumar asset homes is led by an eminent board of directors the company is run by a team of professional leaders and closely guided by an advisory board the true asset of asset homes is the dedicated employees together they have won laurels for the company including national and international awards and recognitions നാം ഓരോരുത്തർക്കും വീട് എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് നമ്മുടേതായ ഒരു ചെറിയ പ്രപഞ്ചം തന്നെയാണ് അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ചിടത്തോളം ഓരോ നിർമ്മിതിയുടെയും തത്വശാസ്ത്രം അതിൻ്റെ വില കൽപ്പിക്കുന്ന സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റുകൾക്കും അപ്പുറത്താണ് നമ്മുടെ നാട്ടിലെ നിയമങ്ങളോടും പ്രകൃതിയോടും സഹജീവികളോടും ഉത്തരവാദിത്തമുള്ളവരായിരിക്കുക എന്നതുപോലെ തന്നെ വളരെയേറെ പ്രാധാന്യമുള്ള ഒന്നാണ് ഓരോ ഉപഭോക്താവിൻ്റെ താല്പര്യങ്ങളോടും ഉത്തരവാദിത്തമുള്ളവരായിരിക്കുക എന്നുള്ളത് അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് വിശ്വസിക്കുന്ന ഏറ്റവും ലഘുവായ പ്രത്യയശാസ്ത്രവും ഇത് തന്നെയാണ് ഇവൾക്ക് ശക്തി പകരാൻ പ്രകൃതിയെ ഉറവരമാക്കാം ഒരു തേക്കിൻ തൈ നടാം ഓരോ മകൾക്കും വേണ്ടി Yes, the only 
depository of trust in the land of assets. Asset, responsibly yours. Asset Homes, responsibly yours. Thank you. Let me now request Mr. Sunil Kumar, the Founder and Managing Director of Asset Homes and an engineer by profession from the uh, Trishur Engineering College to formally welcome the dignitaries and guests. Vishishadhidhikalayim Sadhasiriyim Swagdam Chayiwanai. Asset Homes in the Founder Managing Director, Shri B. Sunil Kumar Arkali Vedi Lekya Kshinikigiyana. Adriniraya Pishta Diale Bahumare Sodagle in the Mukhazi Vikhadanaya Architects Sri Kirtisha TKM Institutions in the Chairman Sri Shahala Sen Musalir Sir College Principal Pivita Department Heads Elah orang kum nos kara. In Oktober onna loga parpeda dina mana. Air itu lahir ti anbati aru mudal sustira phavena sengal pada dina pratha ini mulai cody. Loga membadam elah Oktober mas teh madjat tinggalirca. Loga parpeda dina mana itu aikras safa ajar cody ya. Nampala October masa ini kita kemudian purm, nama kita mana sila, hari mudi itu na uridu sam October renda ana. Logat le, elah dewa le engkau mana sila mana sila ana kudi ulon dunda, atren dewa le engkau le, sanggamas thala engkau le ana, mana sila le engkau le kudumbang le bendu misusicha, uridu ceria mana sila. Adi hari le nuiti ambada amada janma dinam. Nampak agak khusyian bukan? Macam mana? Macam mana? Baru ada dinda rasa beda waya Mahatma Gandhi orang zaman mana kuli? Nampak agak jerikan bukan? Nampak agak arahan yang alenggal, evda poli kena bandung, arahan alenggal, evda sristi kena bandung, awalnya ayat pravesi kena bandung, yang dalam lam cerca jigi nampak sulit dale. Arahan alenggal manusia ni manusia agak tanah yang dalam. Atram, nalla manusia kalau kurit ceri nalla mana kurun bawa nam, abe rendu cipta amu segi nasi thala mana tanah bahawane bendam, orang ke perayaan la thayre ngan dija, mahat fikir tu mayur nusri mahat maga thiude. Tanah bahawane sengal pangal kurucim, bahawane darmana te kurucim, malini bu mukta maya wasas sengal kurucim, mahat maje palapurum edu barang turunna. Nawajiban le, ur lekhena til, mahat maga thi ipragaran kuri kuno. Many households are so packed with all sorts of unnecessary decorations and furnitures which one can very well do without that a simple living man will feel suffocated in these surroundings. I learned 35 years ago that a lavatory must be as clean as a drawing room or a bedroom. I learned this from the West. The cause of many of our diseases is the condition of our lavatory and our bad habit of disposing the excreta anywhere and everywhere. I therefore believe in the absolute necessity of a clean space for answering the call of the nature and clean articles for use at that time in every dwelling unit I see. Manishinda Chujita Bodhate Gurucham, Surachita Maitla Bhavanangala Gurucham, Malah lebih tama ya kait cepat ayer itu rasa bidang orang ayer itu. Inna isaim sendiri le, kalau tu, itu um stress tama itu la, ini bidang itu lebih cinta beyond square feet ini, 
ഈ എഡിഷൻ നടത്തുവാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞാലുള്ള സന്തോഷവും ആഹ്ലാദവും ചാരിതാർത്ഥ്യവും ആത്മനിർവൃതിയുമെല്ലാം അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിൻ്റെ പേരിൽ ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ രേഖപ്പെടുത്താൻ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുകയാണ് കാരണം കൊല്ലത്ത് ഇത്തരം ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാം സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുമ്പോൾ അത് എവിടെയായിരിക്കണം എന്നുള്ള കാര്യത്തിൽ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് രണ്ടാമോ ഒന്നും ആലോചിക്കേണ്ടി വന്നില്ല കാരണം ഒന്ന് ടി കെ എം കുടുംബവുമായിട്ടുള്ള അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിൻ്റെ ബന്ധവും ഒപ്പം തന്നെ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിൻ്റെ പല സ്റ്റാഫുകളും പല തൊഴിലാളികളും പല എംപ്ലോയീസും ടി കെ എമ്മിൽ നിന്നും പഠിച്ചു വന്നവരാണ് എന്നുള്ളതും ഞങ്ങളുടെ പല പ്രൊജക്റ്റുകളും ചെയ്യുന്ന ആർക്കിടെക്റ്റുകൾ ഈ കലാലയത്തിൽ നിന്ന് പഠിച്ചിറങ്ങിയവരാണ് എന്നുള്ളതെല്ലാം ടി കെ എമ്മിനെ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഹൃദയത്തോട് ചേർത്ത് വയ്ക്കുന്നതിന് മതിയായ കാരണങ്ങളാണ് സഹസ്രാബ്ദങ്ങൾക്ക് മുമ്പ് തന്നെ വേൾഡ് ഈസ് വൺ ഫാമിലി വസുധൈവ കുടുംബകം എന്ന് എന്ന പ്രഖ്യാപിത മഹാസങ്കല്പം ഉറക്ക വിളിച്ചു പറഞ്ഞ ഒരു തലമുറയുടെ പിന്തലമുറക്കാരാണ് നമ്മൾ ഭാരതീയർ നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരമ്മ നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരു അച്ഛൻ നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരേ ബന്ധുക്കൾ നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരു ദേശം നമുക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരു കുടുംബം ലോകമേ തറവാട് നമുക്ക് ഈ ചെടികളും പുല്ലുകളും പുഴുക്കളും കൂടി കുടുംബക്കാർ ത്യാഗം എന്നതേ നേട്ടം താഴ്മ തന്നെ ഭിന്നതി എന്ന് വിളംബരം ചെയ്ത ഈ ഭാരതത്തിൽ പോലും ഇന്ന് എക്കണോമിക്കൽ വീക്കർ സെക്ഷൻ എന്ന വിഭാഗത്തിൽ ഏകദേശം രണ്ടര കോടി വീടുകളുടെയും ലോവർ ഇൻകം ഗ്രൂപ്പിൽ എൽ ഐ ജി ഭവനങ്ങളിൽ ആറ് കോടി കുടുംബങ്ങളുടെയും ഭവനങ്ങളുടെയും കുറവുണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളത് വളരെ ഞെട്ടിപ്പിക്കുന്ന ഒരു യാഥാർത്ഥ്യമാണ് അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ചിടത്തോളം ഓരോ ഉപഭോക്താവിനോടും ഓരോ തൊഴിലാളിയോടും ഓരോ പ്രൊജക്റ്റിനോടും നിലവിലുള്ള നിയമങ്ങളോടും പ്രകൃതിയോടും ആകെ തന്നെ റെസ്പോൺസിബിളായിരിക്കുക എന്ന അടിസ്ഥാന പ്രമാണത്തിൻ്റെ ഭാഗമാണ് സമൂഹത്തോടും ഉത്തരവാദിത്ത ബോധമുള്ളവരായിരിക്കുക എന്നുള്ളത് ഏത് അടിസ്ഥാന വിശ്വാസത്തിൻ്റെ കാര്യത്തിലായാലും പ്രവർത്തനത്തിൻ്റെ ഒപ്പം വേണ്ട കാര്യങ്ങളാണ് പ്രഭാഷണങ്ങളും ചിന്താശകലങ്ങൾ സംപ്രേഷണം ചെയ്യപ്പെടുമ്പോൾ സംഭവിക്കുന്നത് ആശയങ്ങളുടെ വിലയിരുത്തലാണ് ഒരു നല്ല പ്രഭാഷകൻ്റെ ഓരോ വാക്കും ഓരോ വരിയും ഓരോ ആഹ്വാനങ്ങളാണ് ഇന്ന് ഈ വേദിയിൽ നിന്നുയരുന്ന ഒരു വാചകമെങ്കിലും ഇവിടെ കൂടിയിരിക്കുന്ന ഒരു മനുഷ്യനെയെങ്കിലും സ്വാധീനിക്കാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഈ പ്രയത്നം അത്രത്തോളം ഗുണകരമായി എന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു ബിയോണ്ട് സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റ് എന്ന പദം ഒരു നിർമ്മാതാവ് ഉച്ചരിക്കുമ്പോൾ അതിന് കൂടുതൽ വിശദീകരണങ്ങൾ ആവശ്യമില്ലാതാവുകയാണ് കാരണം എല്ലാ അർത്ഥത്തിലും ആ വാചകത്തിൻ്റെ അന്തസത്ത പൂർണ്ണമായി ഉൾക്കൊണ്ട് കൊണ്ട് തന്നെയാണ് എല്ലാ വർഷവും മൂന്ന് ദിവസങ്ങളിൽ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് ഇത്തരം പ്രഭാഷണ പരമ്പരകൾ സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് മാർച്ച് ഇരുപത്തിരണ്ട് വേൾഡ് വാട്ടർ ഡേ ജൂൺ അഞ്ച് വേൾഡ് എൻവയൺമെൻറ് ഡേ ഒക്ടോബർ മാസത്തിൽ ആദ്യത്തെ തിങ്കളാഴ്ച വേൾഡ് ഹാബിറ്റാറ്റ് ഡേ എന്നീ ദിവസങ്ങളിലാണ് ഇത്തരം പ്രഭാഷണങ്ങൾ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് ടുഡേ വി ഹാവ് വിത്തേഴ്സ് ആർക്കിടെ കീർത്തി ഷാ an architect by profession and he is the president of indian habitat forum a very well known architect who has uh, a land architect who has done lot of work on social housing and uh, he is responsible for many of the innovations on architectural field he will be formally introduced later I take this opportunity to welcome architect Kirti Shah to this August audience for this function. Welcome you, sir. As a Thomas and a Urkudumbanga Maitanya Angala Kanaka Kunda Pekhtiyana TKM and a chairman at Tula Shahalu Sanu Seliyar, sir. Adihate Eecharangi Lekinyan, sir, Sham Swagadu Jeyinu. കോളേജിൻ്റെ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ ശ്രീ അയൂബ് സാർ ഹെഡ് ഓഫ് ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെൻറ്റ് ശ്രീ സുനിൽ കുമാർ മറ്റ് അധ്യാപക അനധ്യാപക സുഹൃത്തുക്കളെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളെ കൊല്ലം നഗരത്തിൽ നിന്നും ഇവിടെ എത്തിച്ചേർന്നിരിക്കുന്ന കൊല്ലം പൗരാവലിയുടെ പ്രതിനിധികളെ മറ്റ് ഉദ്യോഗസ്ഥ വിഭാഗങ്ങളിൽപ്പെടുന്ന വ്യക്തികളെ പ്രൊഫഷണൽ അസോസിയേഷൻ ഭാരവാഹികളെ പത്ര മാധ്യമ പ്രവർത്തകരെ എല്ലാവരെയും ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വം സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു ബിയോണ്ട് സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റിൻ്റെ തുടർന്നുള്ള എഡിഷനുകളിലും നിങ്ങളുടെ എവിടെയും ആത്മാർത്ഥമായിട്ടുള്ള സഹകരണം പ്രതീക്ഷിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ സ്വാഗത പ്രസംഗം ഉപസംഹരിക്കുന്നു എല്ലാവർക്കും ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം നന്ദി സർ 
ജീവിതകാല സമ്പാദ്യം സ്വരുക്കൂട്ടി വെച്ച് പണിത വീട് നഷ്ടപ്പെടുക എന്നത് ഒരു സാധാരണക്കാരനെ ഏൽപ്പിക്കുന്ന ആഘാതം വളരെ വലുതാണ് പ്രകൃതി ദുരന്തങ്ങളെ ചെറുത്തു നിൽക്കുവാൻ കഴിയുന്ന കുറഞ്ഞ ചെലവിലുള്ള പാർപ്പിടങ്ങൾ നമുക്കിന്ന് ആവശ്യമുണ്ട് ഈ ഒരു വിഷയത്തെക്കുറിച്ച് സംസാരിക്കുവാൻ ഏറ്റവും അനുയോജ്യനായ ഒരു വ്യക്തിയാണ് ഗാന്ധി ജയന്തിയുടെ തലേ ദിവസമായി ഇന്ന് രാഷ്ട്രപിതാവിൻ്റെ നാട്ടിൽ നിന്ന് ഇവിടെ മുഖ്യപ്രഭാഷകനായി എത്തിയിട്ടുള്ളത് ഏറെ സന്തോഷത്തോടെ അഭിമാനത്തോടെ അദ്ദേഹത്തെ അസറ്റോംസിന് വേണ്ടി പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തുകയാണ് ശ്രീ കീർത്തി ഷാ born in the village of kherwa in mesana gujarat acquired his degree in architecture from the school of architecture at sept university ahmedabad concerned that the architecture he was learning at one of the best schools in the country was not sufficiently oriented to the contemporary human settlement challenges especially that of the marginalized groups shah set out to work with the homeless poor in the villages and the urban slums of gujarat india the search of a content and social relevance in professional work the desire to serve the alternative client and an attitude to de-learn and relearn in face of new challenges have shaped shah's 50 year long professional career in six parallel and overlapping streams that include architecture practice grassroots development work as an ngo policy studies and advocacy disaster reconstruction institution development and project consultancy besides studies a field projects organization development and policy related work in rural urban and tribal housing for the low income groups slum development and wider issues of city development he has worked extensively on large scale post disaster reconstruction projects in india and abroad as a member of the prime minister appointed national commission on urbanization in the mid 80s he chaired a working group on urban poverty in india Sri Shah is the founder director of Ahmedabad Study Action Group an NGO he set up and leads for the past 50 years he was president of the Habitat International Coalition a global coalition working on housing rights and people centered urban development is the founder president of Indian Habitat Forum a network that has initiated many activities on affordable housing he was the founder chairman of Home Losers Service Association of Ahmedabad set up following the earthquake in Gujarat in 2001 is a president of the Bangalore based Institute for cultural research and action for the past 30 years and is one of the founders of the Ashoka innovators for the public which now has presence in more than 80 countries of the world he's also engaged actively with the institutional development activities of city net and Asian coalition for housing rights he has been on several committees set up by the Planning Commission of India was on the board of directors of housing and and urban development corporation and has consulted with un agencies the world bank cities development initiatives for asia etc is currently advising the government of india on its 50000 houses project for the war victims in sri lanka and is chairing a committee for rejuvenation and strengthening of the building centers network set up by hatco he is also the chairman of the chief architect of ksa design planning services private limited and ahmedabad based sorry an ahmedabad based firm of practicing architects with projects in various parts of the country and abroad ladies and gentlemen let's now put our hands together to welcome shri kirti shah to the days <laughs> sir we request you to share your insights and experiences on sustainable development Is someone here? I think you're helping me. Uh, I just want to go back. Go back. Start. Make from the beginning. And this is the, the seven. Thank you very much. Uh, I must tell you this, I feel extremely overwhelmed being here. I have a sense of being lost. 
there is now a sense of being lost is this that I say my goodness what I have been doing for last 50 years people that I am looking for are here in Kolam they are sitting here whom I am looking for and I tell you why I am uh, saying this but before I start that I must thank deeply and wholeheartedly Asset and the program Beyond Square Fit to give this opportunity to come here to meet you all and make a presentation on a very interesting subject. But before I do that, I want to make a small confession which will explain why I said people have been looking here, looking for for a long time are here. And this confession is this. And I understand there are a large number of students of architecture sitting here. Are there are students, right? Architecture students? What am my, my real introduction is not what she said. My real introduction is very special and very small. And that is this. I was in the first batch of sept which is country's most famous, well-known architecture school, Center for Environment, Planning and Technology. I was the first batch. That university now is about 55, 60 years old. And thousands of students have gone from that college, very famous. One of the best, not only in the country, in India. But I'm the only one out of thousands who dropped out willingly, voluntarily, when just four months were left to become graduate, saying, I didn't want this degree because architecture profession is not what the society needs. And 50 years that I've done a huge amount of work nationally and internationally, I've regretted many decisions in my life. I've never regretted that decision that I dropped out. I still think that was the right thing to do. The reason is this, and I'm, I'm, I'm really going beyond my, my, I'm going to take three minutes of my presentation to tell you this story. My belief is very strong on this, that architecture is one profession which is completely, completely different from the societal challenges and from the sectoral challenges. And I'll give you a small example and go ahead because this is not what I have come here to talk today. Last year, and I'm sure students of architecture will know, there was a very famous exhibition organized by Rahul Mehrotra called 50 Years of Architecture in India. And I was the first keynote speaker, first inaugural keynote speaker. And I said, before I start my presentation, I want to ask two questions. And there were about 100 famous senior architects and students sitting in that uh, audience. I said, my first question is this. How many of you have heard about Indira Avas Yojana? Out of 100, maybe four or five raised their hand. And I said, out of them, how many have dealt with that program in some form? Someone, one person said, I've done something. No, I don't know whether you know this, but Indira Avas Yojana is not only India's, is world's biggest social housing program ever. Biggest and the longest lasting. Under that program, government of India built 30 million houses over a period of 28 years for the rural poor of this country. It was a well-conceived program. It was a good program. 
but badly done program in the sense that even government admits that not more than 50% of houses are occupied or completed. Which really means that even though it was a good program, it required intervention. It required improvement. It required changes. And therefore, if the country's architect did not even know that such a program existed, who would improve it? Who would change it? Who would strengthen it? Who would make it people worthy? And it's a very sad commentary. It's a very, very sad commentary. And therefore, I'm exceedingly happy to hear and see that asset group talks about social responsibility. And one of the reasons I felt very attracted to come here was that just last month I written an article talking about how entire real estate business essentially is a square foot business. No one is interested in quality, no one is interested in client, no one is interested in in, 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 in sociology of living, no one is interested in environment, no one is interested in sustainability. And therefore I'm delighted, I'm absolutely delighted that I get to see you people and I really have a lot to talk to you in the, at, uh, over a period of time. So, but thank you very much uh, to bring me here and I'm very delighted that, that I'm here. Before I start my presentation, I essentially, because I'm a guest to your city, and I'm a guest to Kerala, I have to do few responsibilities. And the first responsibility is to, I don't know how many presentation has happened after this huge deluge that happened, the, the, the uh, rain havoc that Kerala saw. And I thought, you know, it was my absolute responsibility to, to before I start, to convey my feeling to those who lost their belongings, those who lost their lives, and those who are struggling to get on their feet again. I really wish the government and I really wish people of Kerala strength to get back to their lives again. As you know, international, as you know, the, the disaster rehabilitation is a big international business, not in the negative sense. And I'm sure a large number of international people will come and join. You have got to kind of be very careful. You're going to spend something like 10,000 crore rupees in rehabilitating yourselves. And therefore you must see that rehabilitation is what I call recreation plus Delta X. Delta X in terms of humanity, Delta X in terms of sensitivity, Delta in terms of environment, Delta X in terms of understanding how we move forward. So that's, I really want to wish government and people of Kerala that they fight this battle very well. Second is slightly smaller but personal thing. I wanted to kind of wish Bala Bhaska, the violinist who is struggling for life in, 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 a, in, a, in a hospital in Trivandrum. There is no way I would hear about Bala Bhaska, but he is a family friend. My son-in-law is a very famous musician, Fazil Qureshi, Zakir Hussain's younger brother. And they were supposed to perform next week in Trivandrum. I don't think that will happen. He's lost his daughter already. Both husband and wife are struggling for life. So I wanted all of you to wish them prayers so that they survive and they get back as early as possible. The third thing that I want to do is, uh, this is my fifth lecture in Kerala in the last two years. 
And the one which I delivered, and I'm very proud of, was the Laurie Becker Centenary Celebration. I was here in Trivendram two years ago. And I spoke extensively both about Laurie Becker and about profession in this country. And I thought not many of you must have read my or heard my presentation. I thought I have looked upon Laurie Baker, I've known him for, for 35 years, as a very special person. I've never seen him as an architect. He was a visionary. He was a person who had a lot. He's the one person who understands people. He was one person who understood environment. He was one person who understood social responsibility. And he's the one architect that I know anywhere in the world where people are very proud of, know him. He was a, he was a, he was a household name. And therefore, I think before I start my presentation, I thought I would read a paragraph of how I looked at Laurie Baker. Because Laurie Baker and Kerala had a very special relationship. This is how I saw him. In a manner of speaking, Mr. Baker is to the local architecture what Mahatma Gandhi was to India's freedom struggle. I'm glad you mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. Both led to liberation. Both believed in simplicity. Both drew their strategies from the culture and tradition of the place. Both had a vision of the society they served and both had implicit faith in the common people and their wisdom. Mr. Baker is a true leader in the field which has hardly produced any leader of merit. His contribution and inspiration is not in form of technology or style alone. It is in the form of change in mindset, in the philosophy of work, in the attitude to architectural design, practice and problem solving. He made architecture belong to the people, belong to the place, to the soil, to culture, to tradition, and most importantly, to the local people. And that is no small contribution in a country where architecture in the hands of the foreign train and influence architects is losing its roots. And where alienation, alienation from people, alienation from roots, alienation from tradition, alienation from culture, alienation from climate, and alienation from soil is the order of the day. And in a way, it is a paradox, as Mr. Baker was a foreigner. This is one, and I just wanted another small little paragraph to say that I'm not against architecture. So what I said about architecture is this. Architecture is a noble profession. In the hands of conscientious practitioners, it's a medium to serve the people and also the environment. Service is the word. No architect remembers that word. It combines both art and science. Culture and technology are its pillars. It is a vehicle to translate ideas and dreams into reality. It embraces both reality and reason, creativity and practicality. It has been there from the dawn of the civilization and will always be there. However, the way it is perceived and practiced 
it needs to move architecture needs to move from the mon monuments to people from magazine pages to practical life from the elite to the common people from top to bottom and from the pedestal to the ground so i'm essentially talking about architecture which belongs to people so having said this and taken some of your time to introduce myself there are two more things i want to do which i'll do at the end i want to start this presentation now this presentation called ethical framework for a sustainable world is a complex presentation as a matter of fact to be honest i have a 3 hour long presentation I'll take not three hours. I'll take as long as time we have, but it's in three parts. It talks about architecture. It talks about sustainability in the context of architecture. It talks about cities, urbanization in this country, and how does urbanization relate with the sustainability challenges we have and then if time permits i have a third presentation which talks about sustainability in the broader context of global phenomenon of 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 uh, sustainable development goals millennium development goals the whole sphere of carbon problem that we are facing and how do we deal with it we may not have the time to do the third but we would certainly do the first two uh uh no as i said, I'm, i'm starting and talking about indian cities and i'm talking about the world cities first what am i saying as we approach and this is a very important quotation from habitat 2 that happened in 1996 in istanbul this is a statement made by united nations secretary general who was in charge of habitat 2 what he said is this as we approach the new millennium the world stands at a veritable crossroad in history urbanization holds out both the bright promise of an unequal future and the grave threat of unparalleled disaster that urbanization could be both it could be unequal future it is so bright and good it also could be a disaster and what it will be whether it will be a disaster or a promise will depend on what we do today already more than 600 million people in cities and towns throughout the world are homeless and live in life threatening situations this is wally and out talked about before 1996 so what is the meaning of that is it early what is he saying early decisive action and revolutionary approach to problem solving are the prescription to avoid the unparalleled disaster that if you want to avoid a disaster we require quick decisive actions and revolutionary approach you require to think beyond the box and i'll explain why such a thing is necessary question is is such a thing available is such a thing visible anywhere this is the image of an indian city city on the one end of the people who arrived on the other end are the people who are struggling and slums on the one end is the is the affluence on the other end is deprivation at the one end there's a great desire to fly at the other end on this side is a great struggle to survive this are our cities as we see them and 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 we could deal with this duality i'll come to that every 
human thinks about a dream city. And this is a dream city. The question I'm saying is, is this dream city in tune with sustainability considerations? And I'll come back and explain what sustainability is all about. Is it possible to dream a city of this kind without hurting the sustainability framework? And this is the ideal sustainable city that I wanted to kind of talk about. The same eight thing that I'm, I'm mentioning here is a part of a declaration that 30 urbanologists and people working on Asia's cities got together in a place called Konton about 12 years ago in Malaysia. And they worked for five days and brought out what is called a Konton Declaration. And this Konton Declaration defined what are the ideal cities, what kind of cities are we talking about. So it says economically productive. So we want city which is economically productive. We want socially just. We're talking about culturally vibrant. Politically participatory and environmentally sustainable. This was the kind of image of a city that we want cities like that. Now I have added three subsequently. This was the original ones. We used to call it Panchila of urban vision and good India in Asia. Then we added ecologically sensitive, technologically progressive and adaptive, and people-centric. The people-centric word is very important. You'll be very surprised, and competition that I'll talk about at the end, first thing that we've forgotten about our housing in our cities are people. Do you know, it's very interesting, and I think because there are architects here and there are builders here, that uh, I as an architect, I'm a practicing architect, when I design one house for a rich man, I have ten meetings with the family. I met him, I met his wife, I met his children, and then design a house that I've heard them. When I design an apartment program with thousand houses, I meet no one. And I've found a beautiful word for, for that. It's called faceless client. Imagine this joke. If one family requires 10 meetings, 10,000 family doesn't require anything. And that is because people don't count. That is where it's a square foot business. You're selling square foot. You're not worried about people. You're not worried about children. I'll give you another example. So this is, you will, you will be very surprised to hear this. We got a project in Chennai about eight years ago. Big builder, very big builder. So when I met him first time, I said, sir, how big is your office? How many people? He said, 200 people I have in office and I build about 20 million square feet every year. So I said, oh, 20 million is a very big one. He's one of the biggest builder. So, sir, I said, the people that you have, 200, what kind of people you have? He said, engineers, supervisors, material suppliers, accountants, and the whole big list. I said, very impressive. I said, what is your business? He said, housing. He said, I do only housing and nothing else. So I asked again. I said, sir, what is your business? He, was, he said, why are you asking again? I told you my, my business is housing. I said, the reason I'm asking is this. If housing means families, housing means people, housing means children, 
housing means old people housing means relation with each other housing means growing housing means building culture housing means you know i think becoming ready to face the world he said yes so i said if everything if this is what housing is you have engineers you have all that do you have one person looks after this part of people he said no he said not only i don't have it i never thought in last 20 years that i need one that is the situation with housing in this country and worse is the situation with cities do you know do you know that we build our cities and roads for the cars not for people do you know that in indian cities at this point of time only 4 to 5% have cars 95% do not have them an entire planning for the cities worries about how to run those cars what to do with them all this is because we essentially are not thinking about people we are not thinking about what is needed to be done and this will this this particular presentation will talk about this more more loudly anyway so this is the kind of image ideal image of the city that one is talking about that if given a chance would like economically productive and i would like to explain this uh, a bit because some of the people may not be aware of this you know cities have changed their introduction for a very very long time we saw cities as a places to live dormitories and therefore the major problem were roads and water supply and sewage and scavenging and all that cities have changed their nomenclature now they become what is called engines of economic growth do you know that india has just 30% of its people living 31% people living in cities but 68% of the gdp is produced in cities cities have become engines of economic growth and therefore cities are no longer looked as places to live cities now are looked as places to attract investment if you really saw the change that has happened in the last 15 years earlier there is to be competition between country to country to to, to attract investment that happened state to state and now it's city to city if you go to shanghai if you go to any other chinese city they will say this is our gdp of the city this is a, this is how we are investing so they are essentially talking about cities as places and therefore economically productive city is something very important i don't have much time to go into but i'll just mention that i'll mention that if time permits and i don't think time is going to permit it's already 7 o'clock i wanted to talk about this and this is something this looks very innocent but this is something very dangerous this is a curve which shows how emissions CO2 emissions have grown in the world in the last uh, 50 years if you say 1900 that is where it was about 1500 metric tons and see where it is now in 2009 approximately 7800 metric tons phenomenal and no it has implications it has if time permits i will talk about it but i thought you should you should you should be introduced to this if time permits i want to talk about this this is un millennium development goals and the reason this is to be talked about is this the world 
got together 20, 15 years ago, 189 countries got together and they said that these conditions should change in the last 15 years and I don't want to go into that but something has happened and this is the latest. This is sustainable development goals. Talks about sustainability. And I'll explain to you what sustainability is all about. It says you've got to do 17 things if you want the globe to be sustained, if you want your city to be sustained, if you want your community to be sustained. So these are the kind of three areas I want to cover if time permits. Now I start with urbanization. And this particular graph shows huge amount of things. It basically says how has world changed in the last 50 years. The one was predominantly rural just long some time ago. Now it's become predominantly urban. And this particular graph which is with a complicated would require half an hour to understand basically says these things. Thing it says is this, and it's as it in terms of how from rural to urban is becoming. If you really look at this one in terms of distribution of world population by area, you'll find out that in Africa, 2050, say welcome, 20 percent will be urban. In Asia, it will be 54 percent. Essentially, the argument is this that whatever change, whatever growth that is happening in the next 40 years, the first statement says all of that is going to happen in your cities. Cities are the ones which are receiving huge amount of growth and that growth in the Indian context is so big. This is what it is. We would not even believe this. That in 1964, 61, we had just about 62 million people in our cities. That grew to 30, 372 million in 2011. That is hopefully become 583 million in 2031 and we would have 820 million people in our cities by 2050. So if you look at this 100 years from 1960 to 2060 you are talking about a phenomenal from 61 million to 860 million people in our cities. Do we have the capacity? Do we have the resources? Do we have the land? Do we have the institutions to deal with this? And if we don't, where would these people go? I always say this, that whenever a villager leaves for a city, he has two things in his suitcase. One is poverty, and second, the skill which is not useful in a, in a city. If you go with, with, with no resources, and if you go with no skills, what kind of life are you going to live? And if you don't have resources, what kind of cities are, are, are we going to become? And therefore, this number tells a huge story in terms of what is to be done. This is even more difficult and more interesting diagram. What this diagram says is this. That it took this country 43 years, 43 years to double its urban population from 25 million to 51 million. 43 years. Second doubling took only 26 years. And third doubling with a large base is happening in 20 years. Base is very large. So this country is urbanizing so fast. So unless the policy people realize its implication, unless the people who run your cities you know, realize the implication, we are in for a very serious problem. 
and then i'm talking about what is what are the implications this particular chart says india's 30 urban centers with the largest number of slum dwellers bombay is the only city i don't have heard about this in the world among the biggest city but the graph of people living in slums is higher than the people living in normal housing 52% of the people in bombay live in slums now and bombay is the wealth capital of this country this is the situation not not something that you are not not really familiar it basically tells the stories of how this was happening but like it is not only slums what is happening to other resources and i brought in this example of amdabad the water which was a 63 feet 63 meter level in 1997 see is already at 100 meter levels is dropping dramatically what is happening to housing prime minister is talking about you know building 20 million houses we're talking about housing deficit of 18.4 million houses and among 99% of that deficit is among economically poor and low income groups 99% of the deficit and sir so that for one of the one of the thing that i want to talk to you at some point of time is is wonderful to be building casa grande it's wonderful it's terrific social responsibility also demands that we build houses for them people at the bottom and so that quality is possible social responsibility is possible innovation is possible good design is possible i'll come back and talk about that later on but it's something very important challenge once again talking about in all thing housing and this is a very interesting diagram talks about what are the what are the gaps in affordability this explains that the first people whose income is about 90000 rupees they can afford 275 square foot house they could put in 90000 what is available in market is 440 so that's the kind of 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 of, of gap i don't have time to go into that i'll just mention this this is another interesting very sir this will interest you very much this is a diagram which shows well over how many years it takes to acquire a house it says number of years of average income to buy 100 square meter prime residence using when it takes singapore about 25 years in india it takes 300 years it just tells a story it tells where we are this is another interesting part of the story and and i think we can't forget this and this is this is something very important Indian cities reflect inequalities much more glaringly than any other city. And the most classical example is Ambani House in in Bombay. Building billion dollar house costing 7000 crore just 600 meters away from a festering slum. and you must know as a society as people that poverty is not as dangerous as inequality and inequality is growing enormously and this next diagram as a matter of fact shows that 90% of the income and the wealth of the country is with 10% of the people and as so long that chart remains like this and if you really have the 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 situation at i think in a uh, this is the ambani and ambika scenario this is uh, uh, uh and i think and i think this is this is fact cities essentially are of this kind and this is not being this is not being communist this is not being socialist this is being realist this is being see that this is the situation that we have in our cities this is bombay and this is the distance is just 600 meters this is uh, these are our cities i just realized coming here today these are our cities do you know how many passengers bombay's train carry 
Anyone knows this? How many passengers Bombay's suburban trains carries? 76 million people every day. 76 million people every day. That's the kind of p people that move. I just wanted to say this is a, this is a last dimension of a problem that cities face. Bangalore, 10 people for one tree. Now, interesting part of the story is this. That if you are really talking about lack of resources, if you are talking about not being able to kind of develop infrastructure, what's the problem of growing trees? Why are we not doing it? And, and my next slide, which is not part of this, but will show you a dramatic example. This is, says, how many trees are there in the world? Can you believe that Canada has 8,900 trees per one person? 8,900 trees. Russia has 4,400 trees per person. China has 102 trees per person and India has 28 trees per person. Issue is how conscious are we about uh, our environment. I'm just moving fast and I'm telling you very quickly. Please tell me what time should we stop? Huh? Huh? 15 more minutes? Okay. Uh, okay, then I think, let me move, let me move, I think. And so this is the story, this says, this is a six graph, which shows that in all of our services, be that water supply, be that public transportation, be that parks and open spaces, be that sewage treatment, be that solid waste, we are less than half of what is required. Uh, this one shows how much investment this country needs to look after our cities. They say we require 1.2 trillion dollars uh, in the next few years. This one talks about contribution. This talks about the positive part of cities. This says how cities contribute to GDP. This says how cities produce four times income. And this says uh, when uh, uh, 2030, all these things will happen to the cities. And this is our last, a very interesting slide which talks about three things. This slide shows beautifully, I don't know, just this graph makes it This is the eighth pyramid. This is the eighth pyramid. This says India has. No, that's fine. This shows that. India has 800 million people below the age of 35. This is that graph, that circle. 800 million below people below the age of 35. Which means these are the people who are seeking jobs. This is the people who require employment. Which really means this country in the next 18 to 20 years requires 220 million jobs. It works out to million jobs a month. And we are creating, next slide, about 40,000, 45,000 jobs a month. And this talks in the context of urbanization that if jobs are to be created, it's very unlikely that it will happen in the rural context. It requires urban context. And if instead of a million jobs, we are creating 40,000 jobs, there's a deficit of nine and a half lakh jobs, you are inviting naxalism in your cities. Your young people are not going to remain. This one talks about, this is, uh, this is something I like very much. This is, uh, this is uh, Chandigarh. And this shows our mentality. I'm an architect and very proud architect myself, but the whole question is this. 60 years ago when we wanted to design a capital city, and Chandigarh was not capital of Punjab alone, Chandigarh was capital of India. We had just become independent. We were just opening up to the world. We were just telling that we have arrived. So we were building a capital of this country. What did we do? 
We went to Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier is a genius of an architect. But geniuses don't listen to people, they listen to themselves. And design cities, building cities require understanding people, understanding customs, understanding ways of living, understanding interaction patterns, understanding how the whole thing works. Geniuses don't have a time. And therefore, we produce Chandika. And that happened 50 years ago, 60 years ago. What we are doing now? This is Amravati. This is Chandra Babu Naidu. What is he doing? He goes to Singapore and brings in Krishna Valley, lock, stock and barrel, a new Singapore. This is what it is. And see what is this? New capital city of Adhra Pradesh, built in 83,550 hectares. And, and the long story, I don't even know whether they know that 50% of the 60% of the city is on the flood plains. Let me move very quickly. Okay. Uh, sorry, because we must finish. And I think I'm essentially trying to summarize my understanding of cities in this one slide. And that is this. I just mentioned we have three capitals in this country. Mumbai is the financial capital. Huh? And this financial capital of the country it produces wealth, it produces taxes, it produces all that. Some of the biggest companies are in Mumbai. And it has more than half of its people living in slums. It's the, it's the, it's the financial capital. We have Delhi, which is the political capital of this country. And High Court of Delhi said last year that this is Delhi is a guest chamber. And there was no confusing the word bank use, the, the court used, it said guest chamber. It wanted to, everyone to remind the what happened in Germany after the World War. That this is the kind of place you're living in. This is a place will suffocate you, will kill you. This is the words of the High Court. And Varanasi is the spiritual religious capital of the country. And its river is so filthy that it requires a special ministry. If you not manage your wealth capital, if you not manage your political capital, if you not manage your spiritual capital, how would you manage your small cities? We are not. And it's a very serious problem. And the reason it's a very serious problem is this. Urbanization is the future of this country. You know how many people we add to India's urban population? 30 people every minute. If that is the, if that is the growth, if that is the, the manner in which things are happening, we must understand how prepared we are. Now I'm moving to the second one. And we'll finish it another 10, 12 minutes. And I don't think I'll take that. We have not time for the third one. But this is something very important for you to understand. You will, no one will talk about this to you. So when I'm here, I'll come all the way from Dawad as well, take five more minutes and tell you this. Now, sustainability is deeply related to urbanization and ur what I'm saying is this that without urban sustainability there is no global sustainability. Let me explain how. This is World Commission on Urbanization defined sustainability in this particular fashion. It said development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. That you, you use the resources of the world, nature and other in such a way that you leave something for the future generations to look after themselves. You don't eat away, you don't spoil everything, you don't take away anything. It also says something else, not only this. It says, it says, 
while doing so you should meet human needs you should maintain ecological integrity you should attain social self sufficiency and establish social equity and therefore you can't talk about sustainability only in the context of how you use resources you got to talk about sustainability in the context of meeting human needs context of ecological integrity social self sufficiency and social now in this context i'm jumping to urban and there's a very famous writer english writer called herbert girardet and he said this very beautifully he said is this and this is something very interesting everyone should hear this and quote to your children cities occupy just 2% of the land mass of the world just 2% they consume 75% of the world's resources and they throw 75% of the waste in the environment so cities are very diabolic cities are very dangerous 2% eat away 75% of the resources and throw 75% of the waste in the environment and therefore this figure says that there is no chance of achieving global sustainability or global sustainable development without greater urban sustainability so urban sustainability is an absolute must if you want to achieve now this is something how how as i said earlier cities have a new definition new introduction they are not only places to live they are now engines of economic growth they are centers of technology and innovations the crucibles of art culture and knowledge and they are also last resort of hope and livelihood for those who are trying to escape grinding rural poverty this is this is a very good introduction of cities cities account for 75% of global gdp gdp of osaka one city is 10% higher than the gdp of australia gdp of seoul korea is higher than the entire indonesia this one city share of gdp emanating from the urban center in india is about 60% expected to rise to 70% in 10 more years little over 1/4 of the country's population account for two third of its product it's very very anyway between 70 to 90% of all government revenue is generated in cities and still between 25 to 50% of the people in the cities live in deplorable human living conditions so that's a, that's a contrast so what is how do you handle this what i'm saying is this we are urbanization cities in the sustainability framework that herbert gerardet talked about and 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 commission on sustainability talked about and what it entails in form of fundamental and far reaching changes in the way we think we require different way of thinking different way of living different way of producing different way of transacting and different way of relating to do all the very quiet revolution requires different way of doing all this and then it says if the urban world and the civilization want to survive and produce peace and happiness for the populace we need different kind of economics different kind of growth different kind of technology different kind of energy different kind of institutions different kind of governance 
different, different kind of vision and a very different type of development. That this kind of development will not deliver sustainable cities. This develop, kind of development will not deliver us happiness. Okay. Uh, This is an interesting statement. Sustainable cities in view of global demographic trends that will place almost two-thirds of the humankind in urban center the next 50 years would mean a sustainable world. There is no global overall sustainability without urban sustainability I talked about earlier. And therefore, urban problem solving is not only ensuring water, treating sewage, and managing transport. It is also tackling the underlying forces and processes. It's changing the development itself. This development will not work. And that is a very heavy load, is a very big task, even if, if, if not, it's something that is very heavy. And then what I end by saying is this, that tinkering on the margins will not do. We do all the time tinkering. What it requires is fundamental and big changes. Uh, okay, five more minutes. Okay. Now I just essentially want to kind of jump uh, and 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 talk about. I talked about this kind of development will not work. Development model will not work. What is it? I'm saying. This is something very important for people here to listen and understand. Liberalization of national economies. Development model that we talk about consists of this thing I'm talking about. Liberalization of national economies, global integration, privatization, structural adjustment, corporatization of business, and free reign to market forces. These are the things that constitute development model. Now this development model will certainly do what? It will certainly spur economic growth. It will certainly lead to economic growth. It will promote technological transformation also. And it will ensure high level of prosperity and affluence for a selected few it will certainly do this, but what else will it do? It will deepen poverty. It will widen inequality. It will cause exclusion and marginalization. It will produce wasteful consumerism. It will undermine national sovereignty. It will weaken state authority. It will lead to destruction of the environment. It will deplete natural resources. It will tilt investment balance in favor of cities and within them to big cities. It will cause cultural alienation. And it will seriously damage people's capacity to find solutions rooted in their culture, social norms, value systems, and traditional wisdom. How does the developing world countries like India cope with these forces and factors will largely determine how human, how livable, and how just are the cities. Now, There's a lot. There's a lot. Look, let's, let's, let's leave it. Uh, but just, 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 just let's go back and just take one thing which people like you should hear. Uh, So we always talk about growth. Growth is the answer. Modi Sahib talks about 7.5%, 7.8%. 7 
what one is saying is this that one should not be talking about quantity of growth alone we are talking about standard of growth not only quantity we to talk about not only quality we should talk about nature of growth whether it is exploitative or creative or destructive we are going to look at texture of growth whether it's equalizer or imbalance we got locked we got to look at means by which growth is achieved whether is an ecological harmony or in a pollutant manner and we got to look at substance of growth whether is leading to containment durable happiness and peace or greed strife and violence growth everyone talks about in money term i'm talking about growth in the qualitative terms and unless this is understood unless we we try and kind of you know balance this we would have problems i'm sorry i don't have much time to kind of you know, go deeper into this thank you uh uh but before i complete before i complete i just have two more things to say i mentioned this and so this will interest you very much uh i'm but personally very deeply concerned about what is happening in this country we are modi ji talks about building and you know, i think you know 20 million houses for 2022 under affordable housing program it works out to 7600 houses every day and in all kind of things are happening one of the things that you see that houses are being built large number of houses are building thousands of houses are being built and this are smaller houses no one is worried about design of the houses no one is worried about quality of living this will live especially smaller houses now you must understand whether you rich or poor you have four people five people in a family whether you rich or poor you have 5 feet 6 inches whether you rich or poor you have husband wife and children and therefore to say that we'll dump those people 300 square foot and they live as they want to is not correct what i'm saying is this and i'm not quarreling i'm not quarreling with the with the size if economy is such if a uh, large number of people are poor if large number of people are to be housed we say smaller houses are fine what is very important is can you make smaller house more livable which really means getting into design part and you won't believe me but and this whole idea came because my own office we did this we were designing 300 square foot housing program for a client in chennai and we found out while working on it that in a 300 square foot house we were able to give them 70 square foot of mezzanine without adding an inch and we worked out that without adding an inch of cost we were able to give them 180 square foot of terrace or 150 square foot of land to 66 65% of the people on fourth i said if i alone can do this if i go out to architects in the country and ask them to come up do lot many ideas will come this other part which people don't understand even if you accept that you don't live in a smaller house poverty or low income is not a, a, a continuous phenomenon a person who cannot afford it now will have son earning 5 years down the line 6 years down the line 8 years down the line is it possible to do incremental house in a smaller house we have done work on that we did huge amount of i think and i must have built design not lost the 2000 apartments across the country but whether it is 18 story building or 6 story building or 4 story building each apartment has a open to sky terrace 
Now, if you provide open to sky terrace, this is something that will interest you very much, sir. You're doing two things. A 600 square foot house and a 100 square foot terrace is a multiple use space. It's a barbecue one day, it's a slip, sleeping place second day, it's a washing place third day, it's children's place fourth day. And in our climate, it's a fantastic asset. But more than anything else, it is something that could become an extra room 10 years down the line. You have to look at building bylaws. And I go on saying that building bylaws in the country are stupid, they must be looked at. They don't understand poor. This country has such huge amount of work on sustainable, on affordable housing. We have done no thinking on building bylaws, which are, should be accordingly. So this particular competition essentially asks for two things. One is, we are going to out to architects, we are going out to our thicker designers, we are going out to people across the country. And this is open till, till 20th of December and submission is on 20th of February where we are asking people that don't design new housing, take an existing program for, for asset people, redesign it and see that you really become creative in terms of providing more spaces. And sir, I think there is a need to understand this. I'll take half a minute to explain this. Uh, Government of India is building, sir, 50,000 houses in Sri Lanka for the war victims. Government of India is putting in 1,600 crore rupees. This is a promise that Manmohan Singh gave to Rajapaksha when he came here after the war was over 2009. And one man said, we will not give money, we will build houses and give it to you. I am advisor to this program for the last five years. Before that, while tsunami was on, I was asked by KFW, German Development Bank, to go and design a program for them. They wanted to spend 20 million dollars. At that time, while I was there, the minister had called a meeting to discuss policy, program, design, etc. And I was there, over 30, 40 people, I said, uh, Sir, I've come from Gujarat, we have just uh, done a magnificent uh, rehabilitation program after earthquake. World Bank says this is one of the best earthquake uh, reconstruction program. And we built 180 square foot houses, we built 200 square foot houses, we call them incremental, we say people can add, etc, etc. Minister got very angry. He said, Mr. Shah, if this is what you come here to advise, please take first possible flight, go home. I said, why are you saying that? He said, we believe whether the person is poor or not poor, whether the person is affected by the tsunami or not tsunami, house is a place to grow, house is a place of culture, house is a place for society's development, family's development. And therefore, we will not build anything less than 550 square foot. Sri Lanka, ever since tsunami, has not built a single house which is smaller than 550 square foot. Now, I'm not saying we should do that. We may not have the resources, but I'm saying we've got to be creative enough to see that people live better, people accommodate better, and there are ways of doing this. You have know? got to kind of exercise yourself. So this program requires uh, 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 looking and also looking into bylaws, which will prevent that from happening. And third thing that you've got to go and find out and submit two examples of innovations that people have done to improve their livability on their own. I believe this. People are the biggest designers. You look at our villages, who designed them? This country has 900 million people living in the villages. No architects, no engineers, no HDFC, no HUDCO. People have done them. They know how to do it. And therefore people know how to do it. Go and learn from them and bring it back to this. So that's what we are doing. So students who are interested, this is on website. And I'll leave a uh, few of them here. Anyone who's interested, please participate. There's one. I'll take another one minute to talk about this. This is Smart City Program. This is Smart City Program of Government of India. Now what has happened is this program is 
hugely expensive, costing 2 lakh crore in the next five years to do this program. You know, we don't know this program has come to the top. What we are trying to say is, is what is this program delivering? Is this effective? And not criticize, but how, what can we do to improve it? And in order to do that, I have formed a coalition of 35 people who are working voluntarily to look at this program. We also are going to look at some programs in Kerala. At that time, we will approach you to come and help and participate. This is a public work. This is meant for public good and is meant to kind of improve investment we make and therefore improve our cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So I would request you to please be on the stage. We have a quick interactive session. A couple of questions from the student community is welcome. We have a, one of the most eminent architects of our country here. So I would request you to make use of the opportunity. You can raise your hand. We'll come to you, introduce yourself, and then raise your question. I'm sorry, it's very late, but you can ask in Malayalam as well. Oh, I've been so good, I don't know any question left. <laughs> That's also right. Another way of looking at it. Thank you very much, sir. And now I would request uh, the president of TKM College Trust, Sri Shahal Hassan Muslia, to please come over and present a memento to our speaker. as a mark of her respect and gratitude for delivering this most brilliant lecture on sustainable development and living. Sri Shahal Hassan Muslia. Presents the memento. So thank you very much once again, Sri Shahal Hazan Muslia, sir. Sri Kirti, sir. Once again, thank you very much, sir. So ladies and gentlemen, with this we come to the end of today's program. Let me thank you one and all for your presence and positive interactions. Let me express my personal gratitude to you for your patient listening. You have been a wonderful audience. So let's conclude with the national anthem. I request all of you to kindly rise for the scene. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.